Thank you to 80,000 Hours, a project of Effective Ventures, for supporting PBS. Between 535 and 520 million years ago, a new kind of biological litter began collecting in the ancient oceans of the Cambrian period. Before that, life had been pretty soft and squishy, but the Cambrian saw the spread of the first groups with a major innovation, hardened body parts, like early arthropods with armored exoskeletons. These were made of a tough material that's rich in carbon called chitin, and their modern relatives, including insects, crustaceans, and arachnids, still have it today. This adaptation helped these armored critters expand in huge numbers throughout the world's oceans. As they did, the oceans became seeded with tiny floating fragments of their exoskeletons, which they shed as they grew larger or left behind when they died. And it turns out, without these broken bodies of these bug-like creatures flooding the ancient sea with bits of chitin, our world might be totally unrecognizable today. Because these tiny exoskeleton fragments may have allowed some of the most important microbes in the planet's history to set sail out into the open ocean and change the world forever. The Cambrian is famous for being a pretty formative period in the history of life on Earth. It saw the rise and spread of the first of the major animal groups that were, well, recognizable as animals, with body plans that resemble modern groups today. This radiation of big, complex animal life came with a lot of knock-on effects that shaped the planet in all sorts of ways. And bits of arthropod chitin becoming common in the oceans might have been one of those planet-shaping effects. Because it may have started a chain reaction of microscopic events with global consequences. And until recently, we had no idea about it. See, animals weren't the only group undergoing changes half a billion years ago that set the stage for later ecosystems. Another game-changing evolutionary innovation was brewing in the microbial world that at first glance appeared totally unrelated. Tiny, single-celled photosynthesizing organisms called cyanobacteria started spreading like a floating forest in the open oceans. Today, their descendants are called picocyanobacteria, and they're the most important microbes you've probably never heard of. They're the smallest and most abundant photosynthesizers on Earth. And they drift out in the open oceans and draw down enormous amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, locking the carbon up in their cells. By some estimates, picocyanobacteria alone are responsible for around 25% of all photosynthesis in the ocean. This makes them a major part of the base of the marine food chain, where they play an outsized role in determining how much energy ecosystems have available to start off with, and so how rich and complex those ecosystems can get. Life on Earth just wouldn't be the same without them. But back before the Cambrian, their ancestors lived a more sheltered lifestyle as bacterial mats on the coastal seafloor. So how did the cyanobacteria go from seafloor mat makers to open ocean drifters? Enter the chitin raft hypothesis. This idea was proposed in 2023 by a team of researchers and basically says that around 500 million years ago, these ancient microbes rafted out to sea on bits of dead bug-like critters. Hear me out. The first clue to the chitin raft hypothesis was something the researchers stumbled onto by accident while studying modern picocyanobacteria in the lab. While almost all of them are full-time photosynthesizers, some strains can supplement their diet of sunshine with organic carbon from the environment when light levels are low. This trait is called mixotrophy. And while studying these mixotrophic strains, the researchers found that several of them carried genes for breaking down one type of organic carbon in particular, chitin. When they introduced chitin particles to the microbes carrying those genes, they found that these low light strains were not only feeding on chitin when they could, they were attaching themselves to it too. Could this be how picocyanobacteria originally made a transition to life in the open oceans by surfing on edible rafts made of arthropod exoskeletons? This was the researchers' first light bulb moment. 
Because after all, the open ocean is not an easy habitat to adapt to. It's a harsh, salty, unsheltered environment that's both low in nutrients and exposed to high levels of UV radiation. Definitely a much less comfy and stable habitat than the mats on the coastal seafloor where the ancestors of these microbes had lived. So latching onto carbon-rich chitin particles from arthropod exoskeletons and using them as a backup source of food and shelter may have been what set them on the path to taking over the oceans. The hypothesis was plausible, but to test that the timing actually matched up, the researchers then performed a phylogenetic analysis. They calculated when different bacterial groups diverged from each other based on the mutation rate of their DNA. Then they looked at how genes related to chitin are distributed across the family tree. And they found that the first chitin use genes appeared deep in picocyanobacteria evolution about 500 million years ago when their ancestors were making that initial transition to the open oceans. This is also right around the time when arthropods were expanding in the oceans too, flooding the place with bits of chitin. To the researchers, this seemed unlikely to be a coincidence. Instead, they argued that the ancestral microbes that lived as mats on the coastal seafloor adapted to make use of this new resource. They acquired genes that allowed them to stick to and feed on chitin and used particles of it as rafts to voyage out into the open oceans. It was this rafting that acted as a transitional stage in their huge ecological shift, allowing them to establish an evolutionary foothold in their new, much harsher environment. After millions of years of rafting on bits of dead bugs, many lineages gained the adaptations they needed to thrive in that environment, eventually becoming completely planktonic. They jumped ship, leaving the chitin rafts behind to become full-time photosynthetic drifters. And while many picocyanobacteria then lost the genes related to chitin use, not all of them did. Some floating lineages kept those ancestral abilities, probably because they were useful in certain situations, including the mixotrophic ones that often live in especially low light regions of the water column, which is where using chitin is still a solid plan B when photosynthesis is hard. And without the lineages holding on to those ancient adaptations, we might never have stumbled onto the chitin raft hypothesis at all. While it's still a hypothesis that requires more research, if it's actually true, then these ancient microbes riding out to sea on the broken bodies of bugs was a very important event. One that we're still experiencing the consequences of half a billion years later. When those floating picocyanobacteria spread throughout the oceans, the planet's primary productivity, the amount of organic matter at the base of the food chain available for ecosystems to use, got a pretty big boost. A boost that helped create the rich and complex biosphere that we all know and love. When we tell stories of epic journeys to strange new environments here on eons, animals or other forms of complex life tend to be the main characters. But the story of picocyanobacteria is a reminder that the history of microbes is also full of evolutionary odysseys, and sometimes they're the strangest and most hardcore of them all. Thank you to 80,000 Hours, a project of Effective Ventures for supporting PBS. 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit that aims to help people have a positive impact with their career, especially if you're interested in science and tech. In an average career, you'll work 40 hours a week 50 weeks a year for 40 years. That adds up to 80,000 hours, and how you spend that time is a very important decision for you and the impact you can have on the world. So 80,000 Hours offers research-backed guides for how to find careers that tackle pressing issues, a podcast where they have in-depth conversations with experts on these issues, as well as a curated job board they keep up to date with jobs they think will make a difference. Everything they provide is free, and their only aim is to help you find a fulfilling, high-impact career. To learn more, go to 80,000hours.org. Hey, it's Blake. Hi. If you enjoyed this episode about tiny life forms on our planet, there's a lot more where that came from on another show produced by our team, Journey to the Microcosmos. Join hosts Hank Green and Deboki Chakravarti as they dive into the tiny unseen world that surrounds us. Check it out over at youtube.com slash microcosmos. Thanks to this month's eontologists who float our boats. Jake Hart, Raphael Haas, Annie and Eric Higgins, John Davidson Ng, Melanie Lamb Carnivale, Addie, Tony Dye, and Juan M. 
By becoming an Eonite at patreon.com slash eons, you can get fun perks like submitting a trivia question for us to read. Here's one from Dara. What is the Ediacrium period named after? Put your guesses in the comments and stick around after the blooper to get the answer. And as always, thank you for joining me in the Adam Lowe studio. Subscribe at youtube.com slash eons for more prehistoric stories. Stick around after the blooper to get the answer. We're doing bloopers? Do we? Maybe I don't watch that far. <laughs> <laughs>